Welcome back to Coding in a Cup of Java Lecture 2 If Statements. So let's get cracking. So here we go, back to Dr. Java. The thing we did last time was to set up some if statements here in this example here, but it got, it got a bit messy. We have if there to check if x is the highest number, then we have else here if that's not the case, we check if y is the highest number. If that's not the case, we check if uh, if z is the highest number, and if that's not the case, we say, well, we didn't find the highest number. But as you can see, it's get a bit messy, so, so in like 10 minutes, I'm going to show you how that could be handled uh, a lot better. So right, here's a normal if statement for you. If true, like this, and it is system dot out dot uh, print ln like that, and we can say hello. Nothing special with this. Uh, just if it's true, then we print out hello. However, the if statement itse itself, uh, like it's this part here. Why, why do we have these curly brackets? We can actually write an if statement without those curly brackets, um, and we do so by typing if true system dot out dot print ln hello like that. So that's going to print out hello anyways, because um, the condition is true. We can also have it as false, and if so, it's not going to print something else. So why don't we do this all the time? Well, check this out. So if I'm going to do system dot dot print ln, well, there you go. So now if I do two statements here, and that's just silly, so we put that on the next line, uh, but we can put them on the same line, and let's let's do like that. No. Uh, let's have it like that. So if I do this now, it's going to say hello world, but if I do false here, it's still going to print out wor world, because if we don't have these curly brackets to mark this code block like we do up here, we will only use it for the next uh, statement. Um, so we start here uh, and do the next statement, and here's the semicolon, so there, we're done. And therefore, if it's false, then we're not going to do what's inside it, but we're going to continue here. And we can also do that when it comes to else, um, if else, so we can do that. No, nothing more than this, actually. So we do if that part there, so that's one statement, and then we do else for another statement, like so. So now, because it's false, it's still going to print out world, but if I set true here, it's just going to say hello. So this is an if-else, like we did before, but we can only have one statement in here, and we can only have one statement in there. Everything else is going to be outside the if-else. Right, yo, we're going to use this to make this program up here a bit more compact, because we're going to put else and if together in a way that makes it uh, into some else ifs. So basically, here we go, we ha have else here, we have a code block here for all the different things, that, but we only do have one single thing inside of this else block. Well, you can see a lot of things here, but it's just one single thing, it's this if else, so there's nothing else to it. And therefore, we if we do this, it's not really going to do a difference. Uh, so, um, if I run it now, it's going to be the same thing. I can compile it, it's it's alright, but this looks silly, so I can just move this up here, like so, and all of a sudden we're doing exactly the same thing, but we put those on the same line. I can tell this to move out again, so we have if this happens, or else, and then if again, so these are two different things. It's not something new to call else if, it's just else and if, and without the curly brackets, because we're just using this if here uh, inside the else, we're not having anything else in that else, that sounds weird. Um, so therefore we can do that, put them together, and it gets much more compact. And we can do the same thing here, because inside this else, we only have this if else here, so we don't have multiple statements, and therefore we can remove those there. And uh, now it's still going to work, but we can move it up here to make it look better, and all of a sudden we have this. So in some languages, some coding languages, there's something specific called else if. In Java there isn't, and there's no real need for it. You just put an else and an if together like this, and it's going to work. So at the moment we have the same 
functionality. This is the exact same functionality that we ha had before, but we're first going to check if it's x is the highest number, and if so, we're going to print out x is the highest number, else if, it's not else if, it's not one thing, it's if that's not the case, then we're going to go into another if statement. Uh, and if so, we're going to uh, check if y is the highest number. If that's the case, we, we're we going to print that out. And uh, otherwise, we're going to check if c, c is the highest number, so we print that out, and else we don't uh, have a highest number, therefore we print that out. So when you think about it, when you code, you don't really have to th think about it as two different things. You uh, you don't have to think it about one else and one if. You can think about it something sp uh, special called else if if you want to. Um, but I've just shown you why it works. We basically put one else and one if together, and it gets the same functionality. And since we've got gone from from this. Uh, like bigger form where we had curly brackets in between each and every else, uh, we've seen that this if here, even though it says if and even if this condition can be true, um, it's not going to run and print things out here um, if this uh, is true. So, so an else if is only uh, it's the code in it. It's only going to be run if. Uh, it's true itself, and everything about it is, is false. So if this part here, the x is greater than y and y x is greater than z, is false, and y is greater than x and y is greater than c is true, then uh, it's going to print out y is the highest number. As this, co as these conditions are set up here, these three, uh, in this example, uh, just one of these can be true at one time, but you can set up condition so multiples are through, and then it's going to pick the first one, as you um, easier saw when we had a full structure, where we had if, and an else, and then brackets, and an if, and an else, and brackets, you know, compared to this old thing here. So this is the old thing, um, and in my opinion, and in most people's opinion, this is much cleaner, much easier to see, so, yeah. That's just a way to put it to get if else. So that's the highest number example, and we've sort of made it look quite nice in my opinion. There you go. So now I'm going to talk about, well, basically I'm going to make another example. I'm going to make quite a big example here to show some few, a few tricks that you can use if statements for, and also actually talk about uh, strings, like some, some, some neat things you can do with those. Um, I won't cover it too much, but just give you some examples so you don't. Uh, well, so some some things you can easily mess up, and I'm just talking too much. I forgot this line. Uh, string example. Here we go. Example. And then we get do args. There you go. So here we go. The the core of the program. So it's a string example. That's the name of the program. And then I'm going to create the scanner. And what we want to do with this program is to give the user a question and listen for the reply. And the question is going to be about the user's favorite food and the different options. Well, you can question about question all of them, like what is really food. Uh, but we will have three three different options, and uh, we will print out it like, like like so. So we create a scanner, and then we ask the user, "What is your favorite type of food?" And then we we uh, have option one, pizza. Option two is fish custard, and option three is cake. So obviously, we want to read what the user is typing. So we want to read. Uh, from the scanner using this myscanner.next. Okay. Then we want to check if answer equals pizza, and if so, we might want to print out this thing. So, you, so when you write a proper program, you might want to do other things as well. But in this example, it's just going to give you a response depending of of what what what. Uh, what you're answering. However, this code here, it's not going to work. It's not going to work at all. I can show you. If I run this, it's going to ask me, what's your favorite type of food? Pizza, fish, custard, or cake? And then I can say, well, it's pizza. And nothing happens. 
So nothing happens there. The reason is that we can't check for equality, uh, we can't check if two strings are equal to each other with uh, with these double equals uh, symbols. And the reason, well, strings are a bit special, more into in depth about that, it's not going to be uh, in this course, it's more about objects that we talk about in the next course, but just for now, you will have to learn, you can't do this double equals thingy for strings, so what you will have to do is you do dot equals, like so, like that. So that's how you do it for strings, that's just how you want to, uh, how you have to do it, you will have to learn that that's the case. And the reason why I wanted to show this is because it's quite annoying if you don't know this, because you well, it looks like it's supposed to work. You have answer equals equals pizza. It should work, shouldn't it? But no, it's not because the the pizza you typed in in the input here down there, that's one instance of of, of that. You type that once, and here we typed it another time. So it's a bit odd. Uh, it's not part of this course. So now if I run it, I can type pizza, and it's going to say it's pretty nice, isn't it? So now that part is working, and then I can add the other options as well. And we don't want a lot of like else and brackets and stuff like that. So we go and put them together like else ifs, and that's how you do it. Answer dot e uh, oops, that's not how you spell equals equals, and then we do fish custard like that, and then I'm um, we let's print out. Print, print out Jummy and a smiley, because why not? It says so in my examples. I have to follow. No. Answer dot e uh, equals cake. Like that. So if you entered cake, then we can print out print out uh, yes, cake. Like that. So it screams cake if you say cake, if you type fish custard, it's, it's supposed to type, uh, well, print out yummy and a smiley, and if you say pizza, it's going to say it's pretty nice, isn't it? So now we run this program, uh, we can see that if we uh, run, run it like that, what's your favorite type of food? Pizza, fish custard, or cake? And I say pizza then it's going to say, it's pretty nice, isn't it? But if I type cake, it's going to say, well, it's going to scream cake in my in my face. But never mind that. But however, if I do this, I run it again and type cake like so, it's not going to detect what I'm doing. Because it's looking for the uppercase uh, letter C and then the lowercase combination A, K and E. So uh, what I've typed here, lowercase cake, is not the same. So you can do this in a few different ways how you want to solve this. I like I like this way. So instead of well we get the answer here, the answer equals my dot next, and then we can do answer equals answer to lower case. So that's going to go convert all the characters in the answer that we enter to lowercase. So if we're typing cake uh, in all caps, it's going to give us cake in lowercase. And then we can just compare that to the lowercase versions of, of these strings instead. Like so. You can do it in other ways as well, but I kind of like this way. So you just convert the answer to lowercase, so you can convert it to uppercase if you want to, and then you can just compare it to the, the strings that is all lowercase. Or if you went for, for to uppercase, you just com compile it to those in all uppercase. So now, now we can just compile it and run it. So now if I type pizza, oops, I have to spell it right still. So if I type pizza with a lowercase p, it's going to say it's pretty nice, isn't it? But since we're converting the answer to lowercase, I can type pizza like that as well, or even like scream pizza along like that. It's still going to detect that as my answer um, and it's going to say it's pretty nice, isn't it? Yeah, it needs to shave the spelling mistakes. That, that's the exercise you need. That's the exercise for you. If I if I spell pizza wrong, it's still going to detect it. That's what you will have to write. No, I'm just kidding. So right, uh, so we can detect pizza there and we can detect if we, yeah, we are going to be able to detect cake as well. But there's a problem with our program. If we type fish custard, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. Why isn't it going to work? Well, 
when we type fish custom here, it's going to read the next word. So, um, yeah, only the next word. Fish custom uh, is set up of, of two words, so it's not going to work. We could do like, we add a space there and we uh, read the next word. That would work, right? So we compile it and we do it like that and then we do fish custard and it's working but if I do that for any or the other ones like pizza it's going to like you just entered one word I want another word and I'm like pizza is and you're not, not going to take that but because all of a sudden my answer is pizza space pizza and therefore we get to what I actually mentioned a bit uh, last time uh, just briefly what's called next line and that's going to read the full line so everything I type in here and then when I hit enter all of that is going to be read and stored as the answer so if I type pizza it's still going to work if I type fish custard then it's going to say yummy and no uh, you can't have two favorite foods in, not in this program so that's that part there. But as you can see, I've also, in the options, I've said 1, 2, and 3 as the options, and it would be pretty nice to allow the user to enter 1, 2, or 3 as well. We could do so, you would only be allowed to use 1, 2, or 3, but if we do something like that, then you, didn't, then you can't type in pizza, for instance. So, what I'm thinking of doing is doing it something like this. So we want to check if the, the character, the first character is a digit. If it is a digit, uh, the user is probably trying to enter the result as, um, as the, with the number instead. So if we do an if statement here and check if um, we can do, here we go, answer.char at zero. So what this does, answer.char at, is going to retrieve the character at index 0. In Java and in a few other languages, quite a lot actually, um, you start your indices at 0. So instead of counting 1, 2, 3, 4, you count 0, zero 1, 2, 3. Um, and that's just how it is. So the first character is, is at position 0, and the second one is at position 1, the, th uh, the third one is at position 2, and so on. So we get the first character, so if you type in like 1, just one in the, like the number one, it's, it's going to be the, the, the first character. And then we want to check if that's a digit, and we can do that by doing this. So as you can see, I'm using quite a lot of new things, um, and there, there are quite a lot of built-in things into Java that you can use, and it's, you're not supposed to know them all, but you're supposed to be able to use them if, if you check, check them up on, 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 uh, on the internet. So one can just check the documentation. I'm going to link to different documentations about like what you can do with characters, what you can do with strings and things like that. They will be on the lecture page. I will have to add them there. Um, so for instance, we have two lowercase there. We're using char at to get that character. So what we do now is that we're basically checking if the first character is a number. And then what we can do is we can do like end answer ID. So we want to get the ID of the answer. So if if uh, if uh, you type one, then we want one to be like like what what you read, uh, and two and three and so on. So then we do in uh, answer ID, and then we do integer dot value of. So this is actually going to convert the answer. Uh, into a integer. So if if it says like uh, if we have something uh, that looks like that, uh, it's going to convert that to just that. So we can actually store that in our integer variable here, and then we're going to use it later. So as you can see, we use another thing here. We use integer dot value of, and um, so this example is basically me showing a lot of different things that there are a lot of different things, and and also how how to work with them, but this isn't, isn't really going to work because I want to use them down here and you will see what's going on here. Uh, so I want to check if answer ID equals 1 if that's the case uh, not and or so either there are two ways for it to respond uh, the, using the pizza response that's if you entered pizza or if you entered the 1 the fish custard one is if you entered fish custard or if you answered 2 and the cake one is if you answered cake or if you answer 
answer ID equals 3. Like that. However, this won't work. Boom, errors. The thing is, if you um, create variables and things like that, we're creating a variable in here, we're creating it inside our if statement, uh, or if statement here, and that means that we can only use it inside our if statement. When we get out of it, like here, we don't know about that uh, variable. That variable doesn't exist anymore. So if we will have to uh, want to use it later on, like in here, there, and here, we have to create it outside this if statement. So if we do so here, we create it like that, set that value to zero, and then de remove the in there, uh, there instead. So we're not declaring it inside here. Uh, we create the variable here, and then we change the value inside here if this part here is true. Then we can continue here and check the value like so. The errors are still here because I haven't recompiled. So this is how it works, and we can still access the variable here inside an if statement. That's not a problem at all. So when you go further into if statements and things like that, like different types of code blocks, you can still access the, the variables from, from further out, but you can't access variable from inside if statements unless you're further deeper into that if statement. So, we, so if I have this variable here instead, and I'm just going to comment that out like that, then I can still like do things with it here, you know, but uh, but I can't do it, go, do anything there. So that's why we do it like this. So if it's zero, that means well that's the default value. So that means that uh, there you go. I, I'm not supposed to declare it there. So so if it's zero, that means that we didn't enter a digit, and oh well we might have entered the digit zero, but that's not valid anyways. And if we entered like one, it's going to get give us the answer ID one, and therefore it's going to be uh, the pizza is going to be valid. So let's run this and test. So, what's your favorite type of food? Pizza, fish custard, or cake? So if I type pizza, it's still going to work. It's going to say it's pretty nice, isn't it? Because it's not going to go into this because it checks character dot is digit answer dot char at zero. So it gets this first character, which is this p here. And then it's going to see if that's a digit or not, but it's not, so so we're not going to do anything here. And then we're going to fi uh, find out that answer equals to pizza, and therefore we're going to print that out. Nice. However, if we type 1, it's also going to give us the pizza response. It's pretty nice, isn't it? Because it says 1.pizza here, and when the 1 is our first character, so we get a first character there, and we check that that's a digit, and then we store that there, we sort of pass that as it's called, we pass that as, as an integer, and then we can check answer equals equals to 1. We can also do the same thing with 2, and it's going to say yummy because we answered fish custard. Right, there's however an issue with this. If we run like that, and if we don't enter anything, Oh, what happened? What happened was that we didn't enter anything, and therefore the answer was completely empty. That was an empty string. It, it, it wasn't even a space. It was just the start quote and the end quote. You can create those like, like that. It's like nothing. So we could like do system.out.print ln. Oops, there you go. That's just going to not print out anything. Uh, since I'm using print line, it's going to add a, a new line afterwards, but it's not going to, it's not include, there's nothing there. Um, and that's exactly what we had, and therefore we get an error called string index out of bounds exception, a very long name, uh, and it says that the string index uh, was out of, like that. And we can check the error was on line 16, and that's this line here. So it's very nice to have line numbers. And the reason why this happened was basically because we had an empty string and we tried to get the first character. There is not a first character in a string without characters. Pretty straightforward. So what we will have to do is check that we actually have any characters. And we can do that by the answer dot length. So we check how long that string is. And we sh let's check if that's equals to 1. There we go. What this now will do is that it first check 
Shrek says the answer equals to 1, or well, the length of the answer, sorry, equals to 1. And one thing how uh, Jara works is that if this part here is false, it's not going to be bothered about checking this part here. Just because we, we, we're checking and we need both these to be true for it to run uh, this code inside here. And because that's the case, it's smart and thinks, well, we got one fault, there's no reason to bother about running this code at all, and therefore, because it, it does that, it's not going to try to access this character at index 0, just because, well, the, the length was incorrect. But if it was correct, we this part here, we obviously need to check the other part as well to check if the whole thing evaluates to true. So if I type uh, 1 now, it's going to say pizza. If I type uh, pizza, it's going to give me the pizza response as well. If I, if I don't en enter anything at all, it's not going to crash, but we haven't entered anything valid here at all. So that's this example program here, but we're missing a few things uh, that I didn't add on purpose. Comments. So we might want to add some comments. So we'll print a question, that could be quite a nice. It's quite easy to understand that one, but but uh, it's still nice to have it. And then we can do some more important comments. Store the answer and convert it to lower case to be case independent. Then like that. So then we we uh, have a comment here actually telling us why we do this because otherwise it might feel a bit weird. Like well, we read a line and then we convert it to lowercase for some reason. And we could actually we could uh, we can do it like this. We can split it up in two comments. So we can do that comment here. So the answer read the full line um, since some options use multiple words. So now we're actually telling telling us in the comments why we use next line and why we don't use just yes, next. And here we're also telling us why we convert it to lowercase. And then here we can uh, do uh, uh, check if the answer is a number. If so, store that as answer ID so we can use it answer ID. And then finally we can do something like uh, print uh, a response depending on the answer and the answer ID. So um, some of these comments are not that uh, well useful, you might say, because, well, it's quite obvious that we're printing out the answer here, and it's quite obvious that we're printing out the question here, but things like this could be quite nice, like, read the full line since some options use multiple words, so it's quite uh, it's quite explanatory what, why we're doing it. Why would we use next line when we could use next? Well, we can't because we have fish custard as an option, which has multiple words. Why do we convert it to lowercase? Well, that's because we want to compare it with lowercase uh, words, so we are case independent. And here we are also checking uh, for the number, and I misspelled the answer there, but never mind. So, so it's always nice to have some comments there. And we might have have uh, one thing to do if we want to. We can, for instance, do else. Yes, yes, a normal else. Not an else. Even type system dot out dot print ln. Uh, that's not uh, that's not food, for instance. So if it can't detect what you're talking about, it just prints out. That's not food. Let me compile it. And yes, the comments will not be in what we compiled, so those are not part of the actual program. They are only there to for us to know what's going on. We can type comments, we can comment out uh, code if we want to temporarily remove things. Um, and they're just there to make things look better and easier to use. So now if we type, for instance, pizza, again, it's going to say it's pretty nice, isn't it? If we type fish custard, it's going to say yummy. If I type cake, it's going to say cake there. If I type two, for instance, it's going to say yummy. If I type, however, like four, it's going to say that's not food. Uh, if I type, uh, I don't know, uh, ice 
cream, it's going to say that's not food. Not like cake has more food than that, but it can't recognize the word words ice cream because there's no option here. At that, in the next lecture when we're going to talk about loops, you can you can do so if it didn't if the user didn't enter a valid food, it's going to ask you again like that's not a valid food. Please uh, answer it again and then do all of these things once again. And if that's not true, then we can do that once again. But like I said, that's the next lecture. So that's this example. And uh, I have a f one more thing I want to cover in this lecture. It's called the uh, ternary operator and could be quite useful at times. It could also be quite confusing. But it's good to know what it does if you read someone else's code. And I like using it as well. It's nothing wrong with it. It can just be a bit confusing when you're new to it. Um, but I still want to go through it. It's sort of an, a semi-option to... Uh, if statements, it's it's not you can't do as much as you can do with if statements, but um, it's quite handy. So this is the ternary operator in Java, and it's built up like this. So we first have a condition, then we have oh, well we have a question mark, then we have a value, then we have a normal colon, not a semicolon, and then we have a another value. If I now run this code, it's going to say hello. The reason why it says hello is because this condition is true. If the condition is true, it's going to get get the first value and ignore the second value. If, however, the condition is false, if whatever we have there evaluates to false, I'm using just true and false now because it's simple, for examples, it's going to say goodbye. So if we have true, it's going to give us the first value. If we have false, it's going to give us the second value. This is not restricted to uh, to just string values. We can use them for most values. Um, so we can do oops, true, and then we can do question mark, then we do our first value, then we do colon, and then our second value, and then we end it like so. So now we get 5 because that was true, and then we can use false, and we will get minus 2. So now we can have a condition here depending on things. Uh, so um, that can uh, return to different values. And I'm going to g give you an example on where one could use it. So let's create a new program here. So then we go, we want some user input. So I'm going to do java.util.scanner once again public class ternary oper operator example like this and then we go oops I didn't do that and then we do public static void oops void main and then string square brackets and args that's just how we have to do it and um, finally, we create the scanner like we usually do. Equals new scanner system dot in. Oopsie doops. There you go. Right. So first of all, we want to print out a message to the user, and you will see what this example will be about. So it says, how uh, many persons should share the twenty dollars. So this is well we should basically share those those money between well you will get some money, your friends will get some money, I don't know where the money has come from, maybe you recycled bottles, I don't know. Um, so first of all we want to read that. So int count equals my scanner dot next int. Like so. Do we just read the amount of users or the amount of persons that should um, share those money. Uh, well, those do those dollars. Sorry. System dot art dot print Alan like this, and then we do uh, you get oops you get like that, and then we want to add the uh, amount which is twenty times count. Observe that I'm using integer division now, so um, you can only get uh, whole dollars. You can't get any uh, smaller coins because those are annoying. Um, and then we do uh, for yourself. So 
So now it's going to do things here. So as you can see, I haven't used the ternary operator yet, but you might be able to guess where I'm going to use it. So I already have that, but I'm just going to override that, and now I can run it. So now if I say that, well, we are, I'm the only person, then I get 20 for myself. Uh, let's add that so it looks better. I forgot that. So compile that and uh, run it again. There you go. So I'm the only one. You get $20 for yourself. We are two. Uh, you get 10, uh, we're 20, uh, we're going to get $1. Uh, but, however, what happens if I do this? Oh, crap! So, division by zero, not good. Or even if I do this, like, we're minus 10. Uh, okay. That's weird. How can we be minus 10? It doesn't make any sense. So, if we do zero, we're going to get an error. If, like, a a, 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 a compiler error, be, well, a runtime error, sorry. Because when we're running it, it can't divide it by zero. And if we do a negative number, we're going to get a a logical error. Because it, it's not an error in the... in uh, Nothing is going to crash. Uh, everything is going to run properly. But it doesn't make sense to add a negative amount of persons to share some money. Um, so, what we will do is um, do it like this. So, um, let's see. So, if count is greater than zero, then we want to print out this part. We want to make sure that the count is greater than zero. Otherwise, we're going to say invalid uh, amount of persons. Silly. <laughs> oh. And um, now we can compile that and run it again. So, now if I type 5, I'm going to get four dollars for myself. If I type ten, I'm going to get two dollars for myself. If I type zero, it's going to say invalid amount of persons. Silly. If I type minus ten again, it's not going to work either. So no crash, no weird uh, outputs there. Of course, you can do the same thing here as um, as we did here with if statements. You can do if count is greater than zero. Um, then we can do something. Um, print out it, it properly, otherwise we can do the other thing. But here we can put it in one line if we want to, uh, like that. And sometimes it's good. In this case it doesn't really matter too much, because the only thing these two share, like the first one here, and the second line here, the only thing that is the same is that both are printed out. If the thing we have here is a much more complex, it might be useful to have it. But it's it's a bit of a matter of, a, of taste, but one thing to look out for is that things can get a quite a bit complex with the ternary operators if you use all of them together. It's tricky to see what's going on here. I'm just going to resize that a bit. So, like, which number is it going to use? Um, these things don't really make sense. It's I just copy this from, from some old code. So, like, here's one number. Here's, here's th That's four, that's three, and that's two, one, and zero. Like, which one is going to be used. So it might be a bit tricky to see what's going on. But it, it's it's quite handy to use them at times, but just don't overdo it. Right, so that's what we, we what we have for today. So let's see what we have learned, shall we? So right, we started off with relational operator which which can be used like this. So we have an integer called x with the value of five and an integer called y that has the value of two. Then we used greater than uh, so we do x greater than y like so and store that as result. That's a Boolean value, so that's either true or false, and then we output that, and as you can see it will output true. We had uh, these different relational operators. So we have equals to x equals equals y. So don't don't type just x equals to y because that's going to store the value of y in the variable x. So that's assignment of values where where we check the difference of them. Like we want to check if they are equals to each other. Then we do x equals equals y instead. Then we can check for not equals to by do x exclamation point equals to y. And then we can do greater than by doing x greater than y and so on as you can see on your screen. Then we can uh, use logical operators, which uses two Boolean values um, for the add and uh, or one, where the not is just using one. So we have p and and q, uh, pronounce p and q, and that's going to give us true only if both p and q are true.
So if P is false, for instance, the result is going to be false. If Q is false, then the result will be false. But if both are true, we get true. Or requires one of them to be true. So if both are false, we will get false. Otherwise, we will get true. The not one is just used on its own, like that. So we have an exclamation point, and then the uh, single variable there, or thing single value, and that will just invert it. So if we, ha if we have not true, we get false. If we have not false, we get true. If statements are used like this, so we have if and then a parenthesis, and inside those we have a condition that ends up with true or false, so a Boolean value. Those can consist of a combination of relational and logical operators, which is usually the case. In this instance, I'm just using true and false to demonstrate. So then we have curly brackets and all the statements in, in, in it, it's going to be run in the first example there, I'm just marking those statements with dot dot dot, so you can do whatever you want in there. And then if we have if false curry brackets dot 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 there, and, and the end curry bracket, it's not going to be executed, it's just going to continue after the last curry bracket there. We can do if else, if we have if true, then we're going to run the first thing there, but we're not going to run the statements inside the else. However, if the condition is false, we won't run the first part, but we'll run the second part instead. These could be put together to form else ifs, so we get if false, uh, and the statements there, we're not going to run them, then we have else if true and then we're going to run those statements because that's the first one that is true. As you can see, the next one is also true. We have another else if true. That part is not going to be run at all just because we found a possible solution earlier and it's very easy to see why it's working like that if you break it up into else and ifs. Then we have the ternary operator. So that is a simple um, compact version of ifs, a uh, bit restricted, you can't do too much. So in the first example we will print out first because we have true uh, in, the, in the condition part and then we have a question mark and then the first value is first. Then in the second example we have false question mark and then first colon and second and because we have false as the condition it's going to print out for, uh, not false, second. Uh, second exclamation point, so if you're not the first YouTube comment then you will have to print that out. Then we also have the same thing that we had last time, the question and exercises document. So this document can be found on the lecture page. It's going to be released in about two minutes. It's done automatically. It contains a few questions about what we've been talking about during this lecture that you can answer and see what you've learned. The, the answers to the question will be further down in the document. Then we have exercises that you can do. So that's to practice what we've discussed during this lecture. And there are, all, there are also possible solutions in the end of the document. Of course, when it comes to c writing your own programs, one can so solve the prog programs in a few different ways, or well, quite a lot of different ways. So there's not a correct version, there's just one possible solution. And then we also have a further exploration thingy. In this, in this document there are only one, and uh, that's uh, a way for you to a continue with the coding. So that's something more tricky. It's going to introduce some new things that you can use. There's, however, not a possible solution for that since that is um, a bit trickier. That's just something you can continue with and if you want you can just explore further from there. So this has been Coding in a Cup of Java Lecture 2 If Statements. I've been VSWE and I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you um, uh, I hope you enjoyed it and um, I hope to see you next time. Goodbye.